Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Science, and today I want to discuss the creation and annihilation operators of bosons in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. The creation and annihilation operators are central in second quantization. They essentially do what their name says they do. They create and annihilate particles. As such, they allow us to explore the Fox space. We'll also learn how to use them to write the state of a multiparticle system in a compact form something that will help us simplify the math down the line. This video covers the bosonic operators, but there is a companion video that covers the fermionic operator, so you should check it out. Let's go! We start with the Fox space F, given by the direct sum over all n-particle state spaces, and for bosons these n-particle state spaces are in turn spanned by totally symmetric states. We consider a set of states U forming a basis for a single particle state space V, and we also write the Fox state N1, N2, and so on, in the occupation number representation, and remember that this means that there are ni particles in state ui. The creation operator associated with single particle state ui is a ui dagger, and it is defined by its action on a Fox state, and it is equal to this. What this means is that the creation operator associated with single particle state ui acts on a Fox state by adding a particle to the ui state, so that the associated occupation number ni increases by 1. We also have this proportionality constant in the definition, which for now you can take as a given, and we will see later that this choice helps simplify the maths. Another way to understand what the creation operator is doing is that it allows us to navigate Fox space. If we start with this Fox state with n particles, it lives in the subspace Fn of the Fox space. Then a ui dagger adds a particle to the system in state ui, so that it allows us to generate this new Fox state, which lives in fn plus 1. Let me also make a quick comment about notation. When there is no possible confusion, we will very often write expressions like the definition of the creation operator in this simplified form. Here we're only including the occupation ni of the ui state that is being changed by the creation operator, and we then understand that the occupations of all other single particle states don't change, so we don't explicitly write them down. The next thing I want to discuss is the adjoint operator of the creation operator which is given by a ui. The question we have is, what does this operator do? To figure it out, let's write the matrix element of the creation operator between these two Fox states, and I am using the simplified notation in which I only include the occupation number of the state that the creation operator affects. Using the action of a dagger on ni up here, we get the normalization factor, and then this bracket. The bracket gives 1 because Fox states form an orthonormal basis, so we end up with this. Now let's write the matrix element again. Let's use the conjugation property of the scalar product to rewrite it like this. And now let's use the fact that the adjoint of an adjoint gives the original operator to end up with this. These two expressions for the matrix element imply that ni a ui ni plus 1 equals the square root of ni plus 1, all complex conjugate. But this is a real number because occupation numbers are zero or positive integers, so we can straight away rewrite this without the complex conjugate. Fox states form an orthonormal basis, so the only way in which this matrix element won't vanish is if a ui acting on ni plus 1 gives a term proportional to ni. And then to obtain this expression, the proportionality constant must be square root of ni plus 1. Putting this together, we see that a ui acting on the ket ni plus 1 must be equal to this. To make the expression equivalent to the one we have for the creation operator, we're going to decrease ni by 1, so we obtain this final expression here. So what does a ui do? It removes a particle that was occupying single particle state ui, so it allows us to go from fn to fn minus 1. For this reason, we call a ui the annihilation operator. The next quantity I want to look at are the commutation relations between the creation and annihilation operators. Before doing that, I will simplify notation to make the expressions more manageable and replace a ui dagger by ai dagger and a ui by a i, where we implicitly understand that we're always working in the u basis of single particle states. First, consider two creation operators, a i dagger and a j dagger. We write the action of a i dagger, a j dagger on a Fox state, and again we only explicitly write out the occupation numbers on which the creation operators act. Using the definition above twice, we obtain these two prefactors, and then the state with two extra particles, one in each of the two single particle states. Next, let's calculate the same action, but now exchanging the order in which we apply the creation operators. 
and we now get this expression. Calculating this equation minus this equation, we obtain that the commutator of ai dagger and aj dagger vanishes. In this derivation, we have implicitly assumed that i and j are different, but if they were the same, then the creation operators commute trivially because they are the same operator, so the expression is in fact valid for any i and j. So what does this mean? In the companion video on creation and annihilation operators for fermions, we find that rather than obeying commutation relations like bosons, fermions instead obey anti-commutation relations. This difference between the operator algebra of bosonic and fermionic creation and annihilation operators reflects the respective symmetric and antisymmetric nature of their states. Specifically, the reason why we have the vanishing of the commutator in bosons is because symmetric states don't change when we exchange any two particles. So when writing these expressions, we don't have to worry about the order of the occupation numbers. In the case of fermions, whenever we exchange two particles, we get an extra minus sign. So in that case, we need to add these two equations rather than subtract them to get the vanishing result. And the reason why for fermions we have an anti-commutator rather than a commutator. Okay, so having established the commutation relation for creation operators, what about annihilation operators? We could repeat the same exercise we just did for the creation operators, but I will take a different strategy. Let's first write the adjoint of the commutator of the creation operators. Then let's write out the commutator. Then separate the expression into two terms like this. And remember that the adjoint of a product it changes the order of the terms, so we get aj ai minus ai aj, which is the commutator of aj and ai. This commutator is equal to zero, so we can exchange the order of the terms and write the conventional result that the commutator between ai and aj vanishes. What about the commutator between an annihilation and the creation operator? In this case, we have to distinguish two possibilities. Let's start with i different from j. We can look at ai aj dagger acting on a Fox state, and then using the action of the creation and annihilation operators, we get these two prefactors, and then a Fox state with one fewer particle in single particle state ui, and one extra particle in single particle state uj. We can then look at their action in reverse order, and we get this. Calculating this equation minus this equation, we obtain that the commutator of ai and aj dagger vanishes if i is different from j. What about i equals j? In this case, we can write ai ai dagger acting on an i. Acting with ai dagger, we get a factor of square root of ni plus one and create a particle in the ui state. And then acting with ai, we get another factor of square root of ni plus one and annihilate that particle. We can then repeat this exercise, but now in the reverse order. We first annihilate a particle and then create it back while keeping track of the correct prefactors. Calculating this equation minus this equation, from these two expressions we obtain that the commutator of ai and aj dagger is equal to 1 if i equals j. Putting together this result and this result, we can write them together for arbitrary values of i and j as the commutator of ai and aj dagger equal to delta ij. Before we summarize all the commutators we have obtained, know that we got such a simple expression here because of the choice we made at the very beginning for the normalization of the action of the creation operator up here. If we had made a different choice for the normalization, this commutator would give some other number rather than 1 for i equals j. In fact, we could have gone the other way and taken the commutation relation as the given assumption and then derived the normalization constant above. What this means is that making the assumption at the normalization step or at the commutator step is equivalent and then we can work our way from one to the other or vice versa. Okay, so combining all the results we just derived, we arrive at this set of commutation relations for bosonic creation and annihilation operators. You should really familiarize yourself with this because they're used all the time when doing quantum mechanics in the second quantization language. The next thing I want to look at is the structure of Fox space and how the creation and annihilation operators allow us to navigate it. Let's work with a fixed single particle state and let's first write the corresponding vacuum state that contains zero particles. Acting with the creation operator on the vacuum state allows us to go to this state containing one particle. And I'm not specifying a subindex in the creation operator here because I assume that we're working with the same single particle state all the time for this discussion. Acting again with the same creation operator takes us to this situation with two particles in the state and we can continue in this fashion to go up the ladder indefinitely. We can also start from a given occupation for this state and walk down the ladder by applying the annihilation operator like this all the way to the vacuum state. 
However, once we get to the vacuum state, we can no longer remove more particles because there are none left. This means that acting with the annihilation operator on the vacuum state kills the state, and the action of the annihilation operator terminates at the vacuum state. This discussion shows that the structure of the bosonic Fox space is quite different to that of the fermionic Fox space that I discussed in the companion video linked in the description. The fermionic Fox space terminates in both directions because we cannot have more than one fermion in a single particle state due to Pauli exclusion. In contrast, the bosonic space goes on indefinitely to the right because we can add as many bosons as we like to a given state. This discussion also helps us construct arbitrary occupation number states starting from the vacuum state and acting on it with the creation operator. As we just argued, acting with the creation operator on the vacuum state creates this state with one particle in UI, acting with the creation operator twice gives the state with one particle, and then the state with two particles in UI with the corresponding normalization constant. Repeating this procedure, we get that acting ni times with the creation operator gives the Fox state with ni particles in state UI, with the corresponding proportionality constant obtained by combining all the intermediate ones by simply applying the definition. We can then move the proportionality constant dividing the other side of the equation, and we get the occupation number state built from the vacuum state. Putting this together for an arbitrary occupation number state, we first get this proportionality constant, and then we act an appropriate number of times with each creation operator on the vacuum state. What this is telling us is that we get occupation n1 for a single particle state u1 by acting n1 times with the corresponding creation operator on the vacuum state, and so on for all other single particle states. This final expression also allows us to relate occupation number states between first and second quantization. Remember that in first quantization we can write the occupation number state as equal to this proportionality constant, and then the symmetrizer acting on a tensor product state like this. We can identify the right hand side of these two expressions, and we get that one is equal to the other. We can now compare first and second quantization. The first quantization expression on the right ensures that we have a totally symmetric state through the n factorial terms arising from the application of the symmetrizer S. Plus. The second quantization expression on the left captures all the subtleties associated with the symmetry of the state through the creation operators, which we have seen obey a set of commutation relations that are a direct consequence of this exchange symmetry. The final thing I want to discuss before wrapping up is the occupation number operator. We define it as nui equal to aui dagger aui. To see why this operator is called the occupation number operator, consider its action on a Fox state ni, where again I use the simplified notation in which I emit the u basis, and I only specify the occupation numbers that are affected by the creation and annihilation operators that we're working with. Spelling out the operator ni gives this. Then we annihilate a particle in the usual way, and we get this. And then we create a particle in the usual way, and we get this. What this is showing is that the Fox states are the eigenstates of the occupation number operator, and the eigenvalues ni simply tell us how many particles there are in that state. With this result, we can construct the operator associated with the total number of particles by summing over all single particle occupation number operators, or explicitly in terms of creation and annihilation operators. To wrap up, let's compare the bosonic creation and annihilation operator we've been discussing with the corresponding fermionic operators for which you can find a detailed discussion in the companion video linked in the description. As we have found, the creation and annihilation operators for bosons obey these commutation relations, which are a direct consequence of the symmetric nature of bosonic states. By contrast, in the video on fermionic creation and annihilation operators, we find that they instead obey these anti-commutation relations, represented by the curly brackets, which are a consequence of the anti-symmetric nature of fermionic states. The commutation algebra of creation and annihilation operators captures all the subtleties associated with the symmetry of bosonic states. This forms the basis of the description of bosons in second quantization. Don't forget to check out the video on fermions if you haven't yet, and if you like the video, please subscribe.